Afternoon guys, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Alliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School back with part three in our rope clinic. Before we get started today, do me a favor. Make sure that if you're not subscribed, you hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever I put up a video. And tell your buddies about my channel so they'll subscribe too. Okay, let's get started. What we're going to cover today in this rope clinic, part three, is the tensile strength versus workload of different types of rope and why we use certain types of rope for certain things. We're gonna talk about the knot degradation within a rope when you tie knots in the rope. We're gonna talk about daily carry ropes and what I choose to carry pretty much on a daily basis whenever I'm packing. As much as possible, I carry the same type and lengths of rope with me. We'll talk about that as well. And we're gonna talk about end of the line loops. We're gonna start tying some knots today. We're gonna to talk about end of the line loops, stop knots, and then we're gonna talk about a frictionless hitch. So let's get started guys. Stay with me. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about real quick is rope tensile strength versus safe working load, because they're two totally different things. So let's talk about this 5 16 braided nylon rope that I carry. This is 1800 pound tensile strength. However, to get a roundabout number, of the safe working load. We need to take that number and divide it by 10, which gives us 180, times that by two, and that's 360 pound safe workload. So we don't wanna hang any more off of this rope than that if we wanna operate safely with it. That number decreases dramatically by placing knots in the rope. Probably 30 to 40%, probably more in the 30% range if you're using the proper knots, but you're going to have that much degradation of the rope. So you need to bear that in mind as well. So when I'm selecting rope, I'm trying to figure out what's going to be the maximum size rope I need to carry in case I need to have my weight on this rope versus what's the smallest diameter rope I can carry to get the tensile strength I need. And if I take that 360 pounds and I start degrading it by 30%, it's going to be still above my body weight. And that's what's important to understand. Now you look at something like paracord, which is 550 pound test. And there's a lot of different formulas out there and a lot of different things that say different numbers as far as what the safe operating load is. But using that same mentality to make sure that we're safe, 550 pound test divided by 10 is 55 times two, 110 pounds is really a safe operating range of paracord. Now it's probably a little higher than that, but if we always factor on the low end of things, then we're always gonna be safe. And remember that that 110 pounds doesn't account for putting knots in that paracord either. So you wanna keep that in mind when you're talking about the type of ropes that you're carrying and what you're using them for. Okay, so let's talk about the ropes that you carry every day in your backpack. Generally speaking, I have three different types of rope, cordage, line, whatever you want to call it. The smallest diameter stuff I carry is this 36 bank line. And I consider this my expendable cordage. If I'm going to cut cordage, this is the cordage I'm going to use to cut. If I've got to do a lashing or something like that, where I'm going to cut off a length of cord to make a lash, this is what I'm going to use. So my bank line is expendable cordage. Paracord, if you take 100 feet of paracord, you can divide it up very well so that it serves purposes very conveniently in the woods. Take 30 to 40 feet of that, depending on how far the trees are apart in your area, and make yourself a rapid deployment ridgeline. We've got videos on this, and we'll talk about these knots later in this series. But that's 30 feet to 40 feet of your cord. In my case, about 30 feet. Then I take the rest of that 100-foot hank, or about eight pieces, and I will take a little longer than a fathom. So right around the seven foot mark, because I'm gonna tie knots in that. And I'll take each one of those and cut them down to that one fathom size, and then tie some type of a loop in one end, like a bowling knot or a perfection loop. We'll talk about that later. A stop knot in the other end, and I'll hank that cordage up. And I always have one of those cords in my pocket, always. That's kind of my utility cord that I generally walk around with one in my pocket all the time. You can see I have one in my pocket right now, okay? And that is something that is my EDC. The reason for that is that six foot-ish length of cordage with that loop in it 
can give you lots of advantages when you're even out just hiking. It can replace a shoelace. It can make a makeshift belt. It can tie your jacket around your waist to close off any wind flow or gaps where wind may be coming up through your jacket. It can be used to sling a piece of gear like your ax over your shoulder if you want to walk away from camp to collect firewood and things like that. It can be used to bundle up firewood to walk it back to camp as far as sticks and kindling go. There are lots and lots of things up to and including a bow drill in a drop dead emergency or a tourniquet temporarily until you can get to a real one in your pack somewhere in an emergency. The rest of these cords are what I call utility cords. I keep in my rope bag. And what they're for is four of them become guy lines for four corners of a tarp. One of them generally becomes some type of a tripod or cooking implement that I'm going to quickly lash together. And then the other one generally hangs my pack off of a tree. And that usually leaves me one-ish to work with around camp if I need to. So having those utility ropes is a good thing because you can easily do loop-to-loop -loop connections to extend that cordage, but anytime you grab one, you know how long it is. There's no guesswork. I know this is about six feet. If I need to have more than that, I'm gonna connect two together. If it's less than that, I'm good to go with one. I connect three or four of them together if I had to to get that length with a loop-to-loop -loop or loop-to-toggle connection. But utility ropes are something that's a very good carry for you, and I suggest you think hard about that and adding them to your kit. And then the last thing I carry is this 5 16 braided nylon. I carry 30 to 50 feet, depending on what I'm doing. Generally about a 30 foot length is what I carry. I carry up to 50 if I'm using conveyance of some sort, but I never usually carry more than 50 unless I'm specifically going out to use rope. This gives me something that I can use in emergency to lower equipment down or bring equipment up. I can use this to raise large game if I'm skinning it in the woods or gutting it in the woods. I can use this to for a drag if I'm dragging a deer out of the woods. I can use this thing, uh, I can use this stuff to actually as a, an extra rope to just climb down a semi-steep grade in case I slip or something with prusik loops on it or to climb back up once I get down to the bottom to give me assistance in muddy or unsure ground. I'm not really rappelling off of this rope, although if in an emergency, I probably would, but if you've only got 30 feet, that's not much of a rappel. So this is basically a utility rope but it has enough tensile strength to hold my body weight if it needs to, looking at the tables that we looked at a few minutes ago as far as the breakdown of that rope goes. Okay, so before we talk about tying loops and things like that in the line loops, let's talk real quick because we spoke about connecting these cords with loop-to-loop -loop connections, and you can do that with any loop you desire. First of all, remember to hank these paracord utility ropes because that makes them really easy and convenient to get out and work with. If we're gonna do a loop-to-loop -loop connection, and I've got two lines here, with bowline knots on them. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to come through this line and then I'm going to pull this entire second line through that loop. So I've got this. When I pull these together and dress it down, it's going to give me a reef knot in that line, or in this case, a reef bend. Remember, we're connecting two ropes, and that's considered a bend. Right, but that makes a very secure connection. Now, if for some reason I need a loop on the other end and I don't wanna do a loop to loop connection, I can always do a loop to toggle connection by putting a toggle on the knotted end of this rope with a stick. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the Marline spike. But if we put a toggle in the end of this line, we can just put the toggle through this loop and we'll have a toggle to loop connection. Okay. Now we're getting ready to start tying some loops, knots, things like that in a rope. And what I want you to realize is we're gonna go through end of the line loops, stop knots, and eventually we're gonna go through hitches and we're gonna go through connections, all of that type of stuff. But I don't want to inundate you with 400 knots. What I want to go through with you are like the top five in each of these categories that I've come up with over all these years of using these knots and teaching these skills that transfer well from one to another, transfer from one application to another, and will be the most useful to you in the woodland environment. So, get rocking. Okay, before we start, let me just give you this table real quick so you can use it for reference later. This is some common knots and what they do to your rope as far as degrading the tensile strength of that rope or the working load limit of that rope. So a bowline knot gives you 70 to 75% rope strength after you tie it. A perfection loop, 70 to 73. Double fisherman, 60 to 70. 
Clove hitch, 60 to 65, and an overhand knot, 60 to 65. Remember that any time you tie a knot in the rope, you are degrading the strength of that rope. The only way you can circumvent that and attach the rope to something is with what's called a frictionless hitch. And we'll talk about that after we figure out how to put end of the line loops in our rope. Okay, we're gonna cover a bowling, a poacher's knot, a perfection loop, a figure eight and a bite, and a surgeon's loop. These knots will all give you different capabilities. There's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. Some are better as far as rope strength, some are easier to get untied, and some of them give you advantages once you've tied the loop that we'll talk about as we go. Okay, I'm gonna to try to tie all of these knots two different ways. Once for the camera, and once from a POV standpoint. So we're gonna start with our bowling knot. Our bowling knot, we're going to turn a loop of line over. We're going to bring our line up through that loop, come around underneath the standing end, and then back through the loop here. This is your knot, and this upper part is your loop. So you have to control that knot when you pull it down. If this is correct, this line, this tag end of your line, should always be inside this loop. The advantage to this knot is, it's very easy to get undone after it's been under a lot of stress because it breaks down very easily from the backside. The disadvantage to that knot is that it can slip, so it's better tied with some kind of a stop knot on there if you need to use it for a heavy load. Okay, now let's tie that bowling in a POV. So we're gonna turn it over just like this, overhand loop. We're going to come through that loop and over the top, just like this. I generally pinch this crossover right here so that I can get the loop in my, this right here is our loop. This is the knot. So we're going to drop this through, come over the top, back through that loop. Again, I'm controlling this loop, which is the loop. This is all the knot. And then pull this down, grabbing that tag end, pull it down, and then dress it up. And now you have a bowling knot. And again, it breaks down very easily from the back, and you can pretty much just pull it undone. So it's a very good knot for an end of the line loop. Okay, a poacher's knot basically gives us a noose at the end of a line. So we can use that for things like snares so we're gonna take a bite in the line and we're gonna come over the top of it just like this. We're going to wrap around that bite one time. When we come around the second time, we're just going to go back through those two loops that we made just like this and dress it down. That's going to give us a sliding loop in the line. The advantage to this is, is that it will slide. The disadvantage to this is once it tightens up, it can be difficult to get undone. However, it's a very useful end of the line loop if you need something that will collapse. Okay, let's look at that poacher's noose. So we take a bite in the line. We're basically going to come around that bite two times, just like this. And we're going to drop this tag through both of those loops just like that and pull down tight. That gives us a sliding loop that will collapse on itself if we pull down on it. Okay, let's talk about the perfection loop or the angler's loop. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cross this line over and it's important that this crossing line on top is the standing end of the line. And if we're going to make a large loop, we're going to need a larger tail on a running end or a working end because this is the knot, it's not the loop. We're gonna come over the top of that and this is going to create our loop. And we're going to go all the way around a second time, just like this with the tail between the two loops. Then you need to trap this tail and pull this loop through the line, just like this. When you do that and you pull everything down and dress it up, you'll have a perfection loop and that loop will lay directly in line centered with the rope. That's why it's such a good fishing loop because it's not gonna twist your line being off center. Let's tie this perfection loop from point of view. Again, this is my tail. 
So I've crossed over with the standing end. I'm going to come around, and this being my loop, and I'm gonna drop that tail right between the two loops, just like that. This loop needs to come up through here while I control this tail. Just like this, dress it down. So this line's basically trapped in there. It looks a little bit like a bowling knot when it's done. But you can see this cross over here with the line pinched underneath. And you can see how that loop is in perfect alignment with the rest of the rope. Now, it's very easy to break down because we can just drop this over the top and it breaks down very much like a bowling. However, if you do this in small diameter line like fishing monofilament, it's gonna be difficult to get undone, but it's easier to tie in monofilament than a bowling as well. Okay, let's talk about a figure eight on a bite. We're going to take a bite of line and we're going to come around over the top and behind and then back over the top and through. And that's going to give us, when we dress it down, you'll be able to see that turning into a figure of eight there, just like that. Pretty simple. All right, so to get that figure eight on a bite, we're gonna take a bite of the line. We're going to come around and behind, wrap it around the line, and then come back up through this loop, just like this, dressing everything down as we go. That's going to give us a figure eight on a bite. Okay, a surgeon's loop is another good fishing knot for attaching leaders and things to your line. Take a loop of line, and you start it out just like you would tie a regular overhand knot, except instead of only going through once, you wrap it around and go through twice. And when you dress it down, you'll have what's called a surgeon's loop in the line. Okay, on that surgeon's loop, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a bite of line, come around as if we were going to just tie an overhand knot in the line and go through, except we're going to go through a second time around like this, and then dress all of that down. And that gives us a surgeon's loop. The advantage to this is it's a lot stronger than a single overhand knot, but it's also very quick to tie. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk about stop knots. And a stop knot really is just something that increases the bulk at the end of the line to keep it from slipping through a hole, another knot, or an object of some kind and, or it can be used to add weight to the line if you're going to use it for a throw line. We're gonna talk about the overhand knot, the double overhand knot, the Steve door knot, the figure eight, and the slip knot, okay? And remember that anytime you're using overhand knots and stop knots on the end of a line, it shouldn't be for the sake of seizing that line unless it's a very small diameter cord like bank line, paracord, things like that. Once you get to rope, you really should seize that rope in better fashion with some kind of a wrapping or whipping around the end of that rope. Okay, so the overhand knot, very simple, pretzel style knot. Everybody understands that pretty well. This is probably the worst thing that you can do as far as a stop knot. The easy way to make that better is to make it a double overhand. So you go through twice, just like we did with our surgeon's loop. Again, transferability, except you're doing it on a single line and you're not using a bite of line. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the Steve Door stop knot. And again, this is very much like the poacher's loop that we tied a minute ago, except instead of having a loop, we're going to trap the tail of the line in it. So we're going to go over the top and we're gonna come around the line two times. And we're going to just take it back through that loop and tighten everything down. What that's going to do is give us a little more bulk at the end of the line, but we've also just trapped a tail basically in that poacher's noose or poacher's knot. So no matter how much pressure we put on this, all we have to do is get it loose enough here to be able to get that loop high enough to get this tail out and it's all gonna come undone. So tying this Steve door again, we're gonna take a loop in the line and we're going to come around the line two times just like this. And the second time around, we're just gonna trap this loop here and we're going to cinch everything down on top of it. So all we're going to do with this, we're gonna fold this over and just like we were making that poacher's noose a minute ago, we're gonna come over there twice 
But this time, all we're going to do is trap the tail in here. Instead of pulling a loop through, we're going to pull that loop straight down on the tail, just like this, and crank it down. And that's going to give us a three-lobed or heavier stop knot. Okay, the next stop knot is going to be a figure of eight stop knot. All we're going to do is we're going to come around the line just like this, wrap around the inside, come back up and through the loop to form what looks like a figure of eight, and then dress that down. That figure of eight makes a decent stop knot on the end of a line. The only problem with it is it can jam if it gets under a lot of pressure. Okay, let's look at that figure of eight stop knot. We're just going to come around the line, wrap around and come back up just like this. Looks like a figure of eight. Dress everything down. And that gives us a figure eight stop knot on the end of our line. The last stop knot we're gonna talk about is the slip knot. And again, remember the difference between a slip knot and a running knot is when you pull on the loaded end of the line, it shouldn't come undone if it's actually a slip knot stop knot. So basically we're going to put a loop in the line and instead of pulling the standing end of the line through that loop, all we're going to do is put a loop of line or a bite of line on our tail through and lock it in just like this. Now we have a knot that when we pull on it from the loaded end, it won't come undone, but if we pull on this tail, it releases automatically. So looking at that slip knot, again, we're going to come around and instead of taking this end through and making a running knot, we're just going to take a bite here and put it through, leaving that tail sticking out and collapsing that knot on top of it, just like this, collapsing that half inch basically on top. So now it becomes a stopping knot, but it comes undone by jerking on that loop to release it. Okay, what I wanna to talk to you about real quick is a frictionless hitch. And if you're in a situation where your rope is close to being maxed out on its load limit, you don't want to degrade that rope anymore by putting unnecessary knots in it if you need to anchor it to something. As long as that anchor point, that cylinder, whether it's a tree, a spar, a piling, whatever it is, as long as it's four inches in diameter, you won't put any degradation on the rope by using a simple wrap hitch. And what we're going to do is we're just going to put a figure eight on a bite in the line with a carabiner in it. We're going to wrap around that spar three to four times. When we come around that third time, we're going to drop the rope through that carabiner. What that's going to do is you can see that carabiner stays loose. No matter how much stress I put on this rope, that carabiner is still kind of loose there because what it's doing is it's locked that rope around that cylinder. It's not really putting any stress on the knot. It's not putting any stress on the carabiner really. All the stress is in line right here. And as long as you have that four inch diameter, you're not putting any undue stress on the rope fibers themselves. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you joining me out here for part three of the rope clinic today. Again, take the time to subscribe to my channel. Take the time to hit that notification bell. Take the time to tell somebody else about my channel that might enjoy these lessons. Scouts, all those types of people can benefit from this type of training. I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, for our business, for all our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.